What is it we do with the finding moments when it's like right in front of you? When you know the truth, it's kind of like you're walking out of a cave and you've been in this dark cave for a long time and you go into the light. All of a sudden, it's very easy to get back into the darkness. I, I, I know what I can do in the darkness. My eyes are adjusted to the darkness. But the longer you're into the light, the more that you will see and the better that you will understand. The issue when we have defining moments is sometimes we have to fight the light in order to deal with the truth. Many of us, it's very easy to go back into the darkness and stick our head in the sand and hope that reality will change without me. But it can't. When we know the truth, we must stand in the truth. We must not go into the darkness. We must stare into the light. But staring into the light causes problems. Why is it? Because we do not have what we need. We can't get there on our own. Our philosophy of our world is very simple. When you look at any sign outside of the church. Now inside the church, hopefully you do not have this philosophy. But outside the church, there is a main growing philosophy indoctrinated through everything that they do. There's only one way that you can get to heaven. And that is if you're good enough. If I'm good enough, I can go to heaven. If I do enough good deeds, if I give enough money, if I take care of my mom, if I do the things that I need to do, God is upstairs and he's watching and he's making a tally of everything that I do, everything that I have. And when you look at that philosophy of this world, you can look at every TV show or you can watch every movie. Some place in that is, I hope I'm good enough. I hope I get to go to heaven. But the point is, many people believe that they are good enough. But nobody is ever good enough. No one. You're not good enough. And I'm not good enough. Aren't you glad we don't stop right there? Aren't you glad that that philosophy is not reality? We're not good enough to go to heaven. Good people go to heaven. And bad people go to heaven. Let me tell you, good people go to hell and bad people go to hell. The enlightenment phase of this is found in John chapter 8, verses 29 through 33. And we're going to be looking at this for the next four or five weeks. We're going to take a character, a character in the Bible that the eyes were opened. He had to walk into the light, and he saw what needed to be changed. And I hope that in your life, that over the next few weeks that you will have an awe, eye-opening experience about something within your life. Or maybe it's somebody within your family that you're debating with or you're talking to about God and about how to get to heaven that, that they hold to a view. Well, one of the things that we as a church need to do is learn how to, to defend so we can share, so we can talk. In John chapter 8, verses 29 and 33, uh, this quote, this verse has been used many times, been in a lot of movies, and you just, when somebody says this, you might, do you know who said that? This is Jesus talking. So, so if somebody says something like that, they're quoting the very words of Jesus. And he, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things which pleases him. As he spoke these words, they believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, and you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. We have been in no bondage for anyone. How can you say you will be made free? So, there's a few things here in verse 31 it says if you abide if you put yourself in me if you allow me to hold on to you and let me give you the truth then my word you will be my disciple indeed so if, if, if we listen to the word and we hold on to the word Jesus is saying if you abide in me if you hold on to me if you listen to me and my word then you are my disciples and then you'll be able to see the truth 
and the truth will make you free. And then the Jewish leaders of the day said, said, hey, hey, we are Abraham's descendants. We're covered. We're good. We've got this thing down. We are descendants from Abraham, so we have the market on heaven. And Jesus is saying, I've come to change all of that. The scale of where you come from, what you do, how much you have, and how much you serve is gone. You can be the greatest person on the planet. It doesn't change the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he is coming to that point. The truth shall set you free. Whatever you have a view of God, and everybody has a view of God, I don't believe God would do that. Why would God do that? You look at any society today, you look at our problems with terrorists today, God is in the center of everything that they do. God told us to do this. Or we do not believe God would have us do this. Every one of us have a distorted view of God in certain areas. And we always blame God in some of those areas. Well, God would understand. God would allow that. Or God wants me to do that. And so every view that we have of God, if it is not a biblical view of God, it causes damage in other areas. What is our relational thoughts? What can we do? Good people will not automatically make it to heaven. You can't be good to go to heaven. What is your relational thought about heaven? When you think about that, what do you think? How can you get to heaven? If you're not in a church setting, if you're sitting there and somebody comes up to you and talks to you about going to heaven and they say, wow, I've been good. I, I, the, the balance, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really good. And I know that God likes what I am doing. So I, I listed the things. Why do you think you will go to heaven? I listed some of the things that people say. Number one, it's I've really tried to do my best. I was sincere. I worked hard. I tried to do my best in everything that I did. I was very, very honest and hardworking. I tried really hard to be a good person. You know, I, somebody was on the side of the road and, and I changed their tire. Pat on the back. Somebody ran out of gas and I went over and got some gas for them. Or somebody needed to be moved and I moved them. And you could list all the things that you did that were good things. And I was a good person because I did a lot of good things. But all that is is a list of the good. I try to uh, go to church. I take my family to church. I, I try to invite people to church. I try to be the best father or the mother or best employee I could possibly be. See, you can make a list of all the good. You can make a list of everything that you have done good this week, and that list would be good because we all do good things. But people don't seem to be concerned about heaven because they figure it's just all going to work out in the end because I'm just a good person. We are, we are staking our eternal future on a balance scheme that is never biblical. But there are three points why why it could be a good system. Why it would be nice if this system would work. Number one, it seems like a fair system. Good people are rewarded. Bad people are punished. Everything that we see do that. You go to sports and we try out. If you're good, you make the team. If you're bad, you're cut. If you make a good grade, you're rewarded. If not, you are punished or you have to flunk the class. Law-abided citizens, you are appraised. When you break the law, you are punished. Everything in our system could understand good is profitable, bad is punishable. But that is not God's way. That is the way that we perceive God. And that's when we say, if I am good enough, because that's what I learned when I was in kindergarten. That's what I learned when I was in junior high. That's what I learned when I was in college. Be good, be good, be good. Being good takes Jesus out of the equation. Good people go to heaven. It's what the Bible teaches on the surface anyway. It says he's a good God. We have a wonderful heaven. And if you are a good person, that surely would equal heaven. On the surface, the Bible talks about being good. It talks about uh, doing the Ten Commandments. It talks about the things that are right. In every one of those areas, it's talking about relational, not salvational. If people really believe in the system, 
that everyone just needs to be a good person or a good citizen, they would have a wonderful, wonderful society, wouldn't we? If everybody believed all you had to do is go to be good to go to heaven, our society should be phenomenal. But our society is not phenomenal because being good is not good enough. There are problems with the system. There's always problems with the system. Good people to go to heaven. Number one, there is no clear standard by which we can measure what good is. There's not a clear system. There's no clear standard by saying what is good. Sign up for a class in college and the professor stands up and says, thank you for signing up for the class. Um, there's going to be a test at the end of the semester. Okay, uh, where's our textbooks? There are no textbooks. Where's the literature that we have to read? There's no literature. There's nothing. You just come back at the end of the semester and we'll take a test. And you're sitting there, what, what do I do? What's the standard? How do I know the information? And the professor is saying, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. We're looking at that and you struggle all semester of not knowing what to do. Being good is like staking your eternity on, I hope I'm okay. I hope I'm good enough. The professor in this class should say, here's the text, this is the, 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 the purpose of the class, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to test at the end. But if he says, I am not giving you any regulations, I'm not going to give you anything to go by, you would look at that and say, how could that even be true? But yet, our society is taking, going to heaven is by being good, with no biblical evidence of that. But why does the world hold on to that? The world holds on to that is because that takes Jesus out of the scenario. That takes God out of the scenario. That takes the cross out of the scenario. That puts you as deity and you are in charge of where you go. And that is totally against what the Bible says. It also be like training for a race. And you train for this race and, and you don't know whether it is a 100 meter dash or 400 meter dash, or a three mile run. You just train, and train, and train, and train, and train. And then you go to the meet, and you see the, somebody with the, with the uh, looks like an official uniform, a starting gun, and you ask him, he said, Where, when is my race? And he goes, uh, we'll get to you one of these days. Well, where's the starting line? There are, uh, we don't really have a starting line. Where's the finish line? Uh, we'll figure that out later. You're looking at this, and it's all mass confusion. And that is the way it is when you're talking about going to heaven because you're good. Because we have no standard. What is that standard? It's not a fair way to live your life for a final outcome. It's not a fair way. To hope you're good enough is never good enough. Well, there's three simple scriptures. In Romans chapter 3.10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There's none righteous. In other words, there are no good people. So if you're scaling, I want to go to heaven because I am good, but the scripture says there are no good people, none. In God's view of standard, there are no good people. So how can I say my scale is going to win, but when God says there are none righteous, no, not one. And in Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Under the law, we, there's, there's nothing right. We can't do anything right. But this is the one that we all have heard. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, there's a key word said for how many? For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know that all is all-encompassing. Whether you were a Pharisee back in the day or you're a deacon today, we're all sinners. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, that right there takes the being good out of the scenario because all have sort and fallen short of the glory of God, we can't get to heaven on our own. Even the Ten Commandments found in Exodus only mentions heavens three, four times, but not when talking about heaven. It's describing heaven. 
the Ten Commandments is talking about our conduct. It's talking about what we should do in a relational manner, not necessarily a salvational manner. It never says that if you do all Ten Commandments, you automatically go to heaven. It doesn't say that. The law is a law that was broken that no man could live up to, and no man did live up to it, and all men sinned from it, even if they did live up to it. Even if you had a handful of people that lived up to the Ten Commandments, that still did not give you salvation in Jesus. You have to have that salvation. The standard or the means to salvation, what do we need to do? Uh, what you think is right, I might think is wrong. If we have, what do I think about heaven, or how do I get to heaven? We could all come up with our own ideas, and we can say, well, I think we ought to do this, or I think you ought to do that, or if you go to church, or, or if you tithe, or, or if, you, if you teach a Sunday school class, or if you go to the nursing home, or you do certain things, you're making a step towards heaven. And every good deed that you do is not taking a step towards heaven. Every good deed that you do should be because God saved you and you want to honor him in doing good things. But doing good things do not get you closer to God. Ooh. Doing good things do not get you closer to God. God is in you permanently from the moment that you gave your life to Jesus Christ. He loves you unconditionally no matter what. You know, whether it's in this culture or in any other culture, there's a missionary by the name of Don Richardson that he was in the deep, dark parts of Africa, and he was out sharing the gospel, and he brought a bunch of tribal men into, into the camp, and he started sharing the Jesus story. And he thought, man, I'm just going to share these guys. These guys have probably never heard the story of Jesus. So he brought these guys in, and, and he was telling the story. And about 15, 20 minutes into the story, they were acted bored to death. They said, man, blah, 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 blah. So you could tell they were getting bored. But then he got into the story, and he started talking about the, the, the Jesus part. And they mentioned Judas. They mentioned that Judas betrayed Jesus. And you could see that their eyes started opening up. They started becoming aware of what was taking place. And at the end of the story, they thought Judas was the celebrity and Jesus was the victim. Because in their culture, it is neat to be close to somebody and then betray them. That is an honorable state. Our culture and their culture don't match. But guess what? Every culture has to have Jesus as the center of their life. That is why we have missionaries. That's why everybody must be saved. We can't just say, as long as you think it's okay, or as long as I think it's okay. No, it is what Jesus says is the only way that we can do what God has called us to do. There's no clear way to measure our progress. There's no clear way to measure up. Let me see. Is it 50-50? Is it 51-49? Is passing 70 as long as I do 70% good, where is that drawing line? Some of us hard nosed would say, well, 85, you gotta do 85% good. You know, if you, if you do 15, 20% bad, you can't get to heaven. But then we have all the mercy people. Say, well, as long as you just do 15%. As long as you're good a little bit, God's going to love you. If our eternity hinges on being good and God never bothered to tell you what good is, then what if it works on a system that you don't even know what it's about? To have enough time to do good. What happens when you get to be my age? I'm 52 years old, and I didn't do that good in my earlier life. And if it was a good system, and I know that I'm going to die when I'm 75, and I'm 52, man, I gotta hurry it up and start doing good deeds. I gotta start doing good deeds 75% of the time for the rest of my life. There's a time where it's too late to do good deeds. What fairness is that? What fairness is on your deathbed if you haven't been doing good and then all of a sudden you desire, I want to see God, and God would look at you and say, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You can't do good enough. You don't have enough time to do good. That would be a complete mystery. And that would look at God and say, God, I don't believe you. I can't, I can't believe that I can't get to heaven. I've done good things. 
What if kids grew up in a home where they didn't know Christ? They didn't have parents. They were hoodlums. What happens if they grew up all their teen years and all of a sudden they're 21 years of old and something happens and one of them passes away? They weren't good enough. They weren't good enough. They didn't go to church. Sometimes when you say you have to be good in order to go to heaven, it changes the way that we perceive what good is and what life is all about. If you believe all good people go to heaven, are you ready for this? Then you believe Jesus is a liar. Now, I don't know if you'd actually say that. But if you believe only good people go to heaven, then you are saying right now in your heart that Jesus is a liar. See, people say Jesus did the best he could above the knowledge he knew. They said that he was a good man, and they could even say that he was from God, but they did not say he was God. And God did not send Jesus. They say Jesus was a man that was a prophet that was a very good man. But if we believe God sent Jesus to die on that cross for us, then we have to get out of the mindset that I don't have to be good, I have to be holy. I have to understand what God has done for us. You know, there were even days and times where there were professional good people. Professional good people. They were called the Pharisees. They were good people. If the law says don't stand on that corner, they would put a fence three feet back to make sure that they made a law so they won't break that law. Everything about them was to make a good impression so everybody would think that they are good. They would even stand and pray long prayers so people would think, this guy is spiritual. This guy is awesome. These guys are the ones I want to live up to. If I could be like them, surely I get to go to heaven. Surely it's going to work for me. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he said, you see those Pharisees? You see those guys that pray empty prayers? They are not good enough. What's that do for us? What's that do for us? If the Pharisees aren't good enough, if the religious leaders aren't good enough, or if the guys that don't sin, if they're not good enough, what does that put the rest of us? If they can't go to heaven... Because of them being good, I might as well quit. And that's when Jesus comes into the scene. That's the awe, awe moment. That's when the light is shine brightest. Is when the Pharisees aren't good enough. And the people look at that and say, what about me? What about me? What can I do then? comes on this story, on the last thing that Jesus did. In Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And they had come to the place called Calvary. There they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on his left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, some Bibles may say thieves. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is a neat little search that we found this week, but some Bibles say thieves. And the Romans did not crucify thieves. The Romans crucified criminals. They used thieves. The thieves were put into slavery. They rode boats, worked in the mines, hauled rocks from the temples. These men had no redeeming value to their society. These were criminals. These guys had nothing to honor and to offer the Roman Empire. Thieves were used by them. Criminals were put to death by them. So it was criminals on that cross. Not just mere thieves. People that were hated. People that were despised. People that had hard hearts. People that absolutely detested the Roman Empire. And they hated people. And it says this. And they divided his garments and cast lots. 
and the people stood looking up. But even the rulers of them sneering, saying, he saved others, let him save himself. He is the Christ, the chosen one of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was written over the letters in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Then one of the criminals who hung and blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Here's where it changes. Do you know what one of the criminals did? He recognized who Christ was. The bright light of who Jesus was shone upon him. Everybody around him mocked him. The criminal on the side blasphemed him. But one, the light was on, and he saw who Jesus was. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation. And we, indeed, justly, for we received our due reward for deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. We, what we're dying up here, we deserve it. This guy, he was a criminal. If, if it based on deeds, how many more good deeds was this guy going to have? He stretched out on the cross. He can't do any more good deeds. He's six hours away from death. He's about ready to die. He doesn't have any time to do good deeds. It's not going to be a deathbed confessional for deeds. This guy is dead. The only thing that he can do is to shout out to the one that can save him. And he's not saying, hey, I will do better tomorrow. You don't have a tomorrow. He said, he said give me another chance. I'll do better. Jesus is looking at him and said, listen, he's telling us this. Listen, it's not about deeds. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realizes who Jesus is. He's screaming with agony. He said, remember me when you go into your kingdom. What opportunity did this guy have to do any more good works is over. He said, Jesus, remember me. He acknowledged his need for Christ. Do you understand that? The thief on the cross acknowledged his need for Jesus. It's not about good works at this point. It's when that awe, awe moment lights up and that light is shown within your face. What do you do with the truth? What we must do and you have to do and I have to do, we have to acknowledge our need for Christ. And once we acknowledge our need for Christ, it's not about me, it's not about my works, it's not about what I've done, it's not about how much money I have given, it's not about the time I've spent in the church, it's all about Jesus. And this man knew his deeds were not going to save him. He knew he needed Jesus. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, that means absolutely, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Today. I'm not going to put you in purgatory for a while. I'm not going to let you settle for a while. It's not about your works, or it's not about what you did not do. It's about me. And you acknowledge that I was the Son of God, and I am dying for your sins. I forgave them. I forgive you. And today you'll be with me in paradise. Do you know how you can absolutely go to heaven? Do exactly what the criminal did. Don't promise God you'll change. I'll be a better spouse, parent, or employee. The criminal was nailed to the cross. He had no more time to do good deeds. He couldn't say, give me one more chance. I'll try to do better. I'll start wearing ties to church so I can be a good person. I'll do whatever I have to do. I will do what God has asked me to do. God isn't looking for promises. He's looking for acknowledgement. God is not looking at deathbed confessions and say, give me another chance. What he said, he just wants acknowledgement. He wants to be back in the place of his right. And that's first place within your heart. We had to acknowledge about him and his sacrifice for what he did for you on the cross. Most of the time, good people go to heaven. And sometimes bad people go to heaven. And that's a good thing. Because Jesus didn't come 
for the good. He came for the all. And if you were not a good person in your mind, and you feel like you're out of the scenario that Jesus could save you, you're wrong. The thief or the criminal on the cross was a bad person, and Jesus saved him. The Pharisee that stand and prayed and looked all perfect was a good person, but didn't have Jesus. It doesn't make any difference if you're good. It doesn't make any difference if you're bad. What makes a difference? Do you have Jesus? And when you have Jesus, it changes everything. It changes everything. The only people who go to heaven are those who recognize Jesus. What he did for our sins and know that needs his forgiveness. And when he stood on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. The time of forgiveness is when we accept Jesus as our Lord. And he is saying, Lord, forgive them. These people out here, they don't know what they're doing. This world's concept of being good, they're not good enough. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. But once the light of truth is put upon you, once you need to know, you know what? I can't be good enough. Being good enough is not good enough. I have to realize when John chapter 8, verse 31, if you abide in my word, if you open my word, if you hold on to my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth. That's enlightenment. That's the defining moment. If you are defined and you know the truth, then and only then can you be free from the bondage of lies and free into the forgiveness of God. Have you ever been bound to a sin? Have you ever been addicted to an issue? I've talked to many people that are trying to quit smoking. I talked to one. He uh, had a guy in the hospital this week that he's been smoking for 38 years and he had to get a couple stents put in and, and we were praying right before he went in. He goes, he goes, Bruce, he goes, dude, I can do this. I don't know if I can do it tomorrow. When the doctor tells me no more smoking after 38 years, he said, I, I don't know if I can do that. And I said, Roger, this is going to be the easy thing. Well, I just shouldn't say that. that gonna be, <laughs> this is going to be the easy thing. The hard thing is going to be when you have to stop what you're addicted to. When we're bound to something, the only way that we're going to have that awe -aw moment is something saying, if you don't change, you are going to die. That's that awe -aw moment. And if we believe that being good is good enough, if we believe that our good outweighs our bad, we get ushered into heaven, we need to have an awe -aw moment to say, you know what, the scales don't matter. The penalty of death is hell. But the grace of Jesus is heaven. Jesus taught that good people don't go to heaven. You know who goes to heaven? Forgiven people. Forgiven people. How hard is that to be forgiven? Just like the thief on the cross. Just when he had his defining moment. Just as he was placed face to face, side to side with Jesus. Everybody was hurling accusations at him, mocking him, making fun of him, and denouncing him. He stood up and said, I need him. When everybody around you do not like your Jesus, we stand up. You shall be my disciples if. You know that we have to stand up for Christ because we can't get to heaven by being good. We get to heaven by acknowledging what he did because he was good. He is good. And he has a wonderful plan for our future. So when somebody fights you, when somebody gives you a defining moment, what do you do with that? A defining moment when you are in the light and you know the truth and you need to be rescued. There's one place that you can go, just like the criminal went. There's only one. And that's the Jesus. Jesus. We've all had defining moments. Spiritually, we've had defining moments. In our families, we had defining moments. In issues of life, we've had defining moments. And I was thinking last night, 
What was one of my defining moments? I had to think a little bit about something that, that uh, radically changed my mind and changed my life. And went back, I was a junior in college. And I went back for uh, a summer, back to Wamego just to make more money, basically, so I'd go back for more college. But, uh, I had a couple friends, high school friends of mine. Their names, first was Kelly Bird, and the second one was John Brummett. And uh, we hung out together. We were in high school together. We hung out together. And, um, John Brummett, um, he, he got saved after high school and uh, during that time, but Kelly was not saved. So John and I were conspiring what we're going to do, so we went over to Kelly's house, and we hung out for a little bit, and, and uh, we, this was, we used to not be saved. Do you understand? So now we're saved. We used to not be saved. So we went over to Kelly's house, and we started to try and talk to him about, about the Lord. And uh, he laughed at us, and he kind of mocked us a little bit and said, guys, I don't need that junk. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. And we said, Kelly, really, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to talk to you. You know, we want, we want to be friends, and, but what we have is we want to give to you. And he basically said, I'm not interested. I went back to college. Got a phone call from my mom that when Kelly's girlfriend came home, she opened up the garage door and Kelly was hanging in the garage. My first awe moment was don't give up. Don't quit. He did not know Christ and it's my responsibility to share. In that same context, about five years, late, five years ago, I got a phone call from John's mom that John also committed suicide. So I sat there and I started thinking about the defining moments of our friends. One was saved, one was not. They both did the same thing. They both committed suicide. And I went back to that thought that I had sitting in Kelly's living room trying so desperately to share my faith. Trying to, you know, let him know that Christ loves him. And John's sitting there doing that same thing. I preached John's funeral in front of all my peers, all my high school friends. Granted, they were surprised I was a preacher at that time. <laughs> and this was in a very strong Catholic community. And I had a decision to make. Am I going to talk about how good these guys were? And because they were good, everything's going to be okay. Because one bad deed surely didn't send him to hell. I had the privilege of standing in front of my family and friends, most of them Catholic. And I got to share the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. I got to share the story that John was with me sitting on the living room on the couch talking to Kelly. And Kelly was one of our classmates as well. K talking to Kelly about John's salvation. I got to stand up in front of my classmates and said, I listened to John's testimony and he knew who Jesus was. He knew what Jesus did for him and he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Just because he did something wrong doesn't change the destination that he went to. Amen. And when we talk about Jesus, it's not about doing good. It's not about doing bad. It's about accepting Jesus for what Jesus has done for us. Our lights need to be on. We cannot go back into the cave. We cannot say, I'm going to hide from the truth. I'm going to stick my head in the sand. We must say, that is not true. My salvation is not about me being good. My salvation is not about me being bad. The church doors are not going to fall in. It is about what Jesus Christ has done and Jesus alone for our salvation. Our culture does not want Jesus to be the, fourth, the first and most important person in your life. 
Every TV show, they don't talk about Jesus. They talk about being good, or they talk about being bad. They talk about the scale, as long as we do more good. I hope I make it. You know what? I want surely, today, you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't get baptized. He didn't do more good deeds. He acknowledged that Jesus is Lord, and he needed Jesus for his salvation. That is how we have our defining moment. Every one of us needs to have our defining moment in Jesus before we have our defining moments in life. Because once we have our defining moments in Jesus, it changes everything about us. It changes the way we see things, how we react to things, why we do certain things. Because if Jesus is the Lord, everything else really doesn't matter. If Jesus is preeminent, when things take place, we go to him, not to others. When we are addicted to stuff, we go to him, and he helps us through those things. If we do not have Christ as the preeminent Lord of our life, everything else is a priority. Because when he is off the throne, automatically we put something else on that throne. Most of the time it's ourselves. But when we put Jesus on that throne, we can humbly say, I needed him. I couldn't be good enough. I couldn't get there on my own. All I needed to do is acknowledge and accept the gift of Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we know we're not good enough. We know that we can't make it without you. The scales would never balance. We would never make it. But Lord, with you, we can have assuredly, just as a thief on the cross, assuredly today you told him you would be with me in paradise when we give our life to you. Assuredly. It's not about being good. It's not about being bad. It's about being saved. And you only take forgiven people to the throne of God. So Lord, look at our hearts. Look at our lives. Evaluate us. Give us the epiphany. Let us see. Let us be lights. When we open up our eyes, let us see you. Let us not go back into the dark where we can hide and be adjusted to what we already know. Let us open our eyes to what you want us to know. And in that truth of the word, we can be made free from our past. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'd like to ask you a question. A serious question. Maybe even a life-altering question. We've all heard the stories about being good. But we all need to hear the story of Jesus. And today you heard the story that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he saved a criminal. The criminal wasn't good. He was an evil individual. He did a good thing by not insulting Jesus. But a good thing does not get you to heaven. He gave his life to his Lord. If you have never given your life to Jesus. If you have put your hope, your life, on a hope that being good is good enough, I'm telling you, that is not good enough. If you've never given your life to Christ, I would like to offer you an opportunity to give your life to him today. And it's not a hard thing. It's not a hard thing at all. Because the Bible already says there's no righteous, no, not one. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not through your good deeds, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never said, Lord, I need to be forgiven, I need you to love me, forgive me, I need you in my life. Today, I would like to give that opportunity to you. 